The New Super Mario Brothers series. A series of games with a title that's aged so poorly, every single person to ever talk about these games feels the need to make a joke about it. And these jokes are pretty warranted as well. I mean, these games obviously aren't new anymore. The most recent entry in this series came out over 10 years ago back in 2013. And with the release of Super Mario Wonder a while back, it's safe to say that this series of games that's constantly criticized for its poorly aging name, sequels that blend in together far too much, and reuse of assets, world themes, and music is finally dead. But what about a time when this style of 2D Mario wasn't driven into the ground, rather was just beginning? A time when the title of new actually meant something, and the idea of a new 2D Mario wasn't met with the fear of mediocrity. Let's go back. Back to where it all began. With the original New Super Mario Bros. for the DS. And take a fond look back at it, knowing that the series is finally over, and seeing how, and if, this first entry holds up today. My name is Mario Meister, and welcome to a New Super Mario Bros. Retrospective. Released on May 15, 2006 here in North America, New Super Mario Bros. DS is the first entry in what would eventually become the New Super Mario Bros. series. Development for this game started all the way back in early 2005, shortly after the DS was released. At the time it came out, it was the first completely new 2D Mario game in 14 years. I mean sure, in between that we got the Super Mario Advance series on the GBA, but those were just ports of the remakes from Super Mario All-Stars on the SNES. And although they did have some new content, it was nothing that substantial or enticing. So with this game, the team really wanted to bring back 2D Mario in a big way. No remakes, no remasters, no ports, just an entirely new 2D Mario. One of the biggest things that was different this time around compared to the development of any other 2D Marios was that this time the team wasn't restrained by the restrictions of tile-based sprites. Mario and the objects and enemies around him could have actual physics. This led to the game not only looking and feeling more fluid, but also allowed the gameplay to take advantage of things like Mario's weight, letting him walk on tight ropes and swing off vines, while objects around him like spike balls could be given proper weight and actual physics, letting them roll around and act as an actual hazard. Ironically, pretty early into development, the team actually opted against adding any voice acting into the game, in order to stay true to the spirit of the original 2D Mario games. Even though the Super Mario Advance games before it had voice acting. And I think eventually someone on the team brought this to the attention of everyone else, because later on voice acting was fully embraced, and became a big part of it. And on May 9th, 2006, just a few days before the game was released and development had finally wrapped up, the game was properly shown off at E3 2006, with a really cool interactive website also launching around the same time, which allowed you to explore everything the game had to offer in a really cool way honestly. They should bring this type of stuff back. Upon opening the game for the first time and creating a new save file, you're greeted by this game's ever so simple and to the point opening. Mario and Peach are taking a nice little walk around the Mushroom Kingdom, when suddenly a giant storm cloud appears above the castle not so far away, striking it with lightning, sending the toads into a panic. Mario quickly rushes over to the castle to see what's going on, only to realize the lightning was simply a distraction, as Bowser Jr. sneaks up behind Peach and runs off with her. Thus setting into motion this game's story? Plot? I don't even know anymore. After that, it's on to World 1-1. At first, this level seems pretty standard for a 1-1. You've got your starting Goomba and question mark blocks, some jumps, and overall a pretty laid back level that does a good job at introducing you to the game, and letting you mess around and get a hang of the controls in a safe environment. That is, until you get to this question mark block. In this question mark block contains one of the game's main selling points, the Mega Mushroom. The Mega Mushroom, as the name implies, transforms Mario into a giant form of himself, allowing him to destroy almost anything in his path, including pipes and, uh, even the flagpole. This power-up is an absolute blast to use, and one of the best things about it is that it's not limited to a select few stages. Scattered throughout this game's different worlds are various Mega Mushroom Toad Houses, 
that give you a Mega Mushroom that you can bring into any level. It's so fun bringing this broken power-up into boss fights, or just levels that aren't designed around it, and seeing the chaos that ensues. But the Mega Mushroom wasn't the only new power-up introduced in this game. New Super Mario Bros. DS also saw the introduction of the Blue Shell and Mini Mushroom. The Blue Shell is not my favorite power-up in the slightest. This shell power-up basically transforms Mario into a human Koopa, and allows you to hide inside your shell in order to negate any damage. Cool, right? Well, the biggest upside and downside of this power-up comes from when you start running. When you run, after a short while, Mario just goes in the shell and starts zooming. There's no way to get him out without stopping, and I honestly don't really like this at all. It's hard to just casually have this power-up equipped, because I want to run. But with the blue shell, I'm always just walking because I'm too afraid of running too long and becoming trapped in the shell. So while overall the blue shell power-up is an incredible idea, with some cool uses, its execution is not the best, and leads to me almost never using this power-up unless I absolutely have to. The mini mushroom on the other hand is intentionally designed to be more of a power down in some ways. This item shrinks Mario down to a microscopic size, and makes it so he'll always be one hit away from death, can't squish enemies without ground pounding, and can't break bricks. The main use of this item though is that it lets Mario go through mini pipes and squeeze into tiny spaces he otherwise wouldn't be able to get into. And while this item is a great way to hide secrets and levels, the main thing I always used it for growing up was to turn beating levels into more of a challenge. I always loved seeing how many difficult levels or bosses I could get through just using the mini mushroom. It makes the game's levels that much more interesting. Speaking of this game's levels though, let's talk about them. Being the first new 2D Mario game in almost half a decade, this new soup had a lot to prove when it came to its level design. Games like Super Mario Bros. 3 and World were, and still are held extremely highly, for having some of the best stages in 2D platforming history. So does New Soup DS live up to those standards? Yes, absolutely it does. With the exception of Wonder, I'd say this game has some of the best 2D Mario levels ever. New Super Mario Bros. DS does an amazing job at sticking to the roots of what makes 2D Mario levels fun in the first place, while also introducing so much to the formula and bringing a plethora of ideas to the table. I mean sure, this game does suffer from classic 2D Mario snooze fests like underwater levels, auto-scrollers, and dare I mention, underwater auto-scrollers. But so does every single other 2D Mario game. Where this game's levels shine the brightest though is in their uniqueness. For me, this game has without a doubt some of the most memorable levels in 2D Mario. Almost every single one feels unique and their ideas aren't overused and driven into the ground. I absolutely love when a specific level has a one-off gimmick you just never see again. Just look at the end of World 2-6 where you have to use a pump to shoot a cork with a piranha plant on it out of the pipe. Or in World 6-A, the sand tornadoes that fling Mario into the air and let him twirl back down. Or how the entirety of World 7-3 takes place on a giant wiggler moving through the clouds. These are just a few examples of the many one-off gimmicks the levels in this game have. Even playing through this game 18 years after it came out, I'm still shocked at how cool some of the levels are. And on the topic of how cool some of the levels are, I want to take a minute to talk about one of my favorite levels in this game, World 2-3. This stage has a theme unique from any other level in the game. That being its sewer theme. In this sewer level, you navigate around in the pipes of a giant sewer. Or at least I think they are the pipes because of the green outline here and the fact that you hear this sound when reaching another area. This stage has a bunch of different paths to explore, and it's always been a really big standout to me from everything else in the game. I loved revisiting this stage during my replay through for this video, and I really hope they bring this level theme back in a future 2D Mario game. I mean, sewers and Mario go together pretty well, so I'm surprised we haven't seen it return. Something else this sewer stage features apart from its unique design though, is a secret exit. Now, although secret exits weren't completely new in this game, I mean technically they've existed since Super Mario Bros. 1 on the NES, the way they work here is completely new. Instead of finding a warp zone or putting a key through a keyhole, Secret exits are usually found by finding a hidden pipe or path that leads you to a red flagpole to symbolize that it's a secret exit. The very first secret exit in this game, found in World 1-2, takes a page out of Super Mario Bros. 1's book and just kinda completely copies it. 
Instead of taking the pipe at the end, if you can get enough height and get on top of this hidden path here, sound familiar? You can just run past the intended exit and find a secret hidden pipe at the end of the path, which leads to the secret exit. Yeah, I guess they weren't very covert about where they got their inspiration from. Jokes aside though, this is a great way to introduce the concept of secret exits in this game. I mean, almost everyone knows about that iconic warp zone secret area in Mario 1. And this is the very second level of the game, similar to how Super Mario Bros. 1's iconic warp zone was in its World 1-2. So veterans of the series, and probably even a fair share of casual players, are going to notice and find this secret exit, and learn how they work in this game. And although this secret exit doesn't unlock much, just letting you skip one level and fast track to World 1's tower stage, the level you do fast track to, the tower, holds a secret exit of its very own. The secret exit here though is not nearly as obvious and simple as the first. This one requires you to have a very observant eye. And notice that one of the stone blocks in this room is moving differently from all the others. Upon investigating this suspicious stone block, you're led to a hidden room. And if finding this secret room wasn't already hard enough, if you want this room to be more than just a way to skip right to the end of the tower, you have to have a blue shell equipped to break these bricks and finally reach the flagpole. And instead of just allowing you to skip one level by taking this exit, the reward for this one is much better. This unlocks you a cannon that lets you skip all the way to World 5. The game is full of secret exits like this, and does a great job at incentivizing deep exploration of levels. But secret exits are the only new thing in this game that incentivizes exploration. Newly introduced in this game are the Star Coins. Star Coins serve as New Super Mario Bros. DS's evolution of the Yoshi Coins from Super Mario World, but in my opinion are arguably done so much better. Whereas the Yoshi coins from World weren't really tracked and didn't serve much of a purpose, Star Coins are a polar opposite. Hidden in every single level of the game are three Star Coins for the player to collect. Collecting them is purely optional, as you can beat the game without collecting a single one, but they honestly add a ton to the experience. Some Star Coins are out in the open and extremely hard to miss, while others are hidden pretty well, and usually offer the player a challenge in order to collect them. It's such a great way to stop players from just dashing through every single level. It encourages taking your time and searching these levels to see what secrets they have to offer. Secrets and hidden areas have always been a huge part of 2D Mario, but it wasn't until this game where it was outright encouraged. Star coins are a currency here that allow you to unlock otherwise inaccessible levels in Toad Houses. And after you beat the game, you can use them to buy cool backgrounds for the bottom screen. These were a genius addition to the 2D Mario formula that seamlessly fit into the gameplay and don't feel shoehorned in. Another thing introduced in this game that seamlessly fits into the gameplay is Mario's updated 2D moveset. Prior to this game, Mario's 2D moveset was nothing more than a single jump, twirl, and slide. With New Super Mario Bros. DS, however, Nintendo went one step further and actually incorporated some of Mario's 3D moveset into 2D. Now you can double and triple jump alongside now being able to ground pound. And in an early beta of the game, it looked like you would actually be able to kick and punch as well. In my opinion, this combined with the new physics makes Mario feel a lot better than he did before. I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't have much of an issue with retro 2D Mario games controls, but going back to them after playing this game, you can definitely feel how much more stiff Mario is in those games compared to here. This switch up and feel has been coined by some as being floaty, but I vastly prefer this feel. Overall, I'd say the controls in this game are really solid. I almost never have a moment where I feel it was the controls fault rather than my own. Which is honestly something I can't really say for 2D Mario's before this. Moving on though, we have the different worlds of the game. Now, looking back at this entry, the different worlds here feel painfully unoriginal. I mean, you got your classic grass, desert, snow, beach, jungle, mountain, cloud, lava themes that we've seen done to death almost always in that exact order. But you gotta understand that when this game came out, not only were these themes not overused and boring, we actually had never seen two of them before, that being the jungle and mountain themes. It's really hard to appreciate the world themes of this game now, because again, they became so overused by later New Soup games, but all the themes here, especially their order, were really good for the time. One of my favorite things about the themes here, and something that still holds up today, is World 8's theme. 
When you first arrive, it isn't that basic Lava Land Bowsery theme you'd think it would be. In fact, when you first get here, there isn't any lava in sight in any of the first couple levels or on the world map. Instead, it's got this creepy and eerie vibe where instead of being surrounded by lava pools and volcanoes, there's dead trees polluting this wasted land and crows flying around trying to attack you. All while this eerie music plays in the background. It's absolutely not what you'd expect coming into this world, and I love it for that. Another thing people probably didn't expect going into this game, and something I don't think a lot of people remember, even Nintendo considering how they've handled this recently, is New Super Mario Bros. DS's unique bosses. Every other 2D Mario game before this, and actually every other 2D Mario game after this, either reused Bowser or Bowser Jr. as the boss in every world, or used the Koopalings, who while having some unique attacks, don't really differ all that much from each other, especially in design. In this game, however, every single end of the world boss fight is unique. I say end of the world because this game introduces the towers. The towers are basically just like the mid-castles from Super Mario Bros. 3. However, instead of being horizontal levels that you move right or left through, they are vertical levels, hence them being towers. All the towers here have you face off against Bowser Jr. And while this fight with him can get pretty stale, even if he does start to pose an actual threat in the later towers, the unique boss fights in the castles at the end of each world more than make up for it. You got Mama Pokey in World 2, a completely original character that's never seen again. Cheap Skipper in World 3, another unique boss we never see again. Petey Piranha in World 5. And my personal favorite, Monty Tank in World 6. The thing I love about Monty Tank is, while all the other bosses are just different forms of existing enemies or giant versions of those enemies, or in Petey's case, just... Petey, Monty Tank isn't any of those. It's just a Monty Mole in a literal tank, and that is so funny to me. Overall, the unique bosses here are incredible. I love how all of them not only offer a unique way to fight them, but they all have amazing designs and are very distinct from one another, which is something I can't really say about the Koopalings. But before we talk about Bowser in the final level, there's just one more thing I'd like to talk about. Well, I guess two things. And that's this game's side modes, Versus and the minigames. Starting off with Versus, or I guess properly referred to as Mario vs. Luigi, this mode is just what the name implies. A mode where Mario and Luigi face off against each other. Here you're placed in one of five uniquely crafted levels for this mode. And see who can collect the most stars before the time limit runs out. What makes this mode interesting though, is that you can attack the other player by ground pounding, jumping on them, or just by using a power up. This causes the other player to drop one of their stars, and allows you to steal it from them. I remember playing this mode with one of my friends all the time when I was younger. And it was absolute chaos in the best way possible. One of the coolest things about this mode though, is that just like a bunch of other DS games, only one of the people actually has to own the game in order to play. By using download play, you can connect without owning the actual game and enjoy this mode for all it has to offer, which is amazing. And something really cool I discovered a while back is this online website that aims to recreate the mode. You can play it online with friends and it's an absolute blast. They've also added a bunch of new custom stuff to it like new levels and power-ups, and I would highly recommend trying this out if you want to relive the nostalgia of this mode, or even experience it for the first time. Moving to the minigames though, this is where I and a lot of others sunk a lot of the time we were playing this game into. While sure these minigames were in Super Mario 64 DS first, most people associate them with New Super Mario Bros. DS as this game sold almost triple the amount of copies as 64 DS. The minigames here are an absolute blast, as they always are. They make great use of the touchscreen and are pretty unforgettable. I've said this a few times now, but seriously. Why didn't Nintendo ever sell a big collection of these minigames and add a bunch of new ones? Imagine ones themed around other characters. It could have been so cool. My personal favorite minigames here will always be the Luigi ones. I can't stress enough how long I spent in this Mushroom Kingdom casino gambling my life away with Luigi. Just one more round, I swear I can stop. Just one more round. But the Luigi games aren't the only good ones. Wanted is absolutely iconic, and I always loved the Whack-A-Mole game. These minigames are just great. There's something that Nintendo absolutely did not have to put into the game, but also something that add that much more to it. 
And I mean, while we're here, one hand couldn't hurt, right? Bowser is pretty absent throughout a majority of this game. You don't see him at the beginning when Peach is kidnapped, and up until the final world, you only see him once in World 1's castle, where you face off against and seemingly defeat him rather easily. In his place, however, for most of the game, doing his dirty work is Bowser Jr. This guy is all over the game. He's the one to kidnap Peach, he's the one you fight in every world's tower, and he's the one you see at the end of every main castle running off with Peach. Honestly, with how present he is in this game, I'd actually call him the game's main antagonist rather than Bowser. He seems to be the one coming up with and pulling off all these cunning plans, while Bowser just kind of serves as a giant tanky turtle guard. Regardless though, after your encounter and subsequent defeat of him in World 1, Bowser doesn't reappear again until what seems to be the final level of the game, where it's revealed you did defeat him back in World 1. However, he's returned as Dry Bowser. A version of the character I like a lot more in this setting, as you can't just simply defeat him with fireballs because he's immune. This fight is pretty cool, but nothing really all that special. Just run under him when he jumps into the air, and boom, you win. It's only after defeating him here do you realize that World 8 is much larger than it originally seemed to be. And that level was absolutely not your final confrontation with Bowser. And after making your way through the extra levels that unearthed themselves, you're met with the final level of New Super Mario Bros. DS. This final level is without a doubt my favorite final level in the New Soup series, and honestly was my favorite final level in the entire 2D Mario series up until the release of Wonder. This level has you navigating through a castle much different than any we've seen before, and that's because it can literally flip upside down. A lot of the rooms here at first glance look pretty weird in design, but that's because with the flip of a switch, the entire place is flipped on its head. Literally. This gimmick is so cool, and creates a level that I never get tired of on my replaythroughs of this game. It has so many awesome little secrets sprinkled about, and it's just a super well designed and thought out level. But after making your way through this cool rotating castle, you're met with the final boss battle. Upon stumbling into Bowser's lair, Peach can be seen just kind of chilling right above everyone. And on the ground, Bowser Jr. is sitting by a pile of Bowser's, uh, bones. It's actually kind of sad. That is until he throws the bones into this pot of what seems to be poison acid, and Bowser suddenly reanimates and comes back to life, ready to fight. The cool thing about this fight though, is that you're not just fighting against Bowser, you're also fighting against Bowser Jr. at the same time. And if you come in unprepared, this can be a pretty difficult fight because you have to deal with both of them at the same time. If you do come in prepared though, it's not that bad. And overall is a pretty cool fight to end off an amazing return to 2D Mario. For a return to a style of Mario that hadn't broken much ground in over a decade, New Super Mario Bros. DS does an absolutely stellar job at getting 2D Mario back on its feet. This game stays true to the roots of what made 2D Mario fun in the first place, and then some. The amount of unique ideas in this game is honestly mind-blowing considering how dead the series was at the time this came out. Even looking back at it today with wonder now, this game still stands on its own as an amazing 2D Mario, and just an amazing game in general. The creativity present here embodies everything that the series was all about, and it's so sad to see the mediocrity it fell to with each sequel to it never really breaking as much ground and making as much of a splash as it. I mean, there were so many genius concepts here that just never made it into the sequels, like the unique bosses, some of the one-off level gimmicks, and as much as I dislike it, it's still crazy we never saw the blue shell return. No new soup game to follow this one has ever lived up to its side modes. Versus mode in the minigames were legendary additions that made an already amazing game that much better. Going back to this game after not playing it for so long has made me realize how much I still love this game. 
It will always be my favorite new Super Mario Bros. game, and one of my favorite 2D platformers ever. Even almost 18 years after its release, New Super Mario Bros. DS is still a blast today, and is a game I feel shouldn't be held to the same mediocre standards as its sequels. This game is truly incredible.